Since the popularization of video sharing sites online, I think we've all kind of gotten a feel for the sort of video we usually expect when we think of internet video. Um, kids, pets doing something clever, skateboarders, and of course the obligatory bald white man speaking into a web camera. Now there are other types of videos out there. Um, obviously the networks are putting theirs online now and for over half a decade would-be filmmakers have been making short films and putting them online hoping, praying for an audience. Well, in most cases that hasn't materialized. But today we're going to look at someone who is the exception to the rule. He made a short film that got the millions of viewers that are normally reserved for Mentos dropping into Pepsi bottles. And most importantly, he did it starting with one of these. Well, my name's Terry Pounds. Thank you very much for being one of my viewers. And this is A Microscopic Life. Society has always scorned the truly unique, um, but that's a burden you choose to bear when you can bend the very walls of reality with the power of your imagination. That's a gift to be respected and feared. It's like we're waging an epic battle against conformity. Now, these two lovable geeks are not the subject of this month's episode. So, actually, I suppose they could be. No, they're the two main characters in a short film called Fear of Girls, created by a colleague and close personal friend of mine, Ryan Wood. Now, Ryan wrote the script, shot it on a shoestring budget, and put it online, expecting it to, you know, get the handful of viewers that an independent short film usually gets. Well, instead, it took off overnight and took Ryan places I don't think he ever could have anticipated going. Well, we're going to look at how Ryan started out, how he came to make Fear of Girls, the phenomenon that that became, and uh, where the series and Ryan have gone since. Um, I've wanted to be a filmmaker for many, many, many years, um, and, but the path to me was always kind of a little shady in terms of what the best route was. Uh, I did go to film school a little while, for a little while, but I never graduated. Um, I decided that the best course of action uh, in lieu of a film degree is actually going out and investing the money and doing your own film. And so I made a, my first film, and I think I made every single mistake one human being's allowed to make, uh, which so, you know, a film that should have cost me just a little bit of money ended up costing me an enormous amount of money. Um, and uh, you learn. You're early. Well, I'm the kind of guy that always needs to be prepared. Oh, really? <clears throat> Your table's right this way, sir. The fact that I get it done, I think that's that's huge. Um, you know, we, we did some very minor festivals, but you 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 kind of earn your stripes after you do a first film, and it was fun. It was a good little film. It's called Murphy's Law. It's about a bad guy, it's about a guy with a zip. Um, write what you know. So, uh, but uh, it did lead to some uh, some nice momentum into the second film that we did, which was uh, Pitching Mother. A monkeys, rabid monkeys, rabid monkeys, real rabid monkeys, real rabid monkeys. Why? Because I wanted the look on the actor's face to be of real fear. 
Well, I think it's going to be very difficult to find 100 rabid monkeys. Mother, I'm sure I can hire someone to find what I need once we get the money for the movie. And how are you going to, to get the money to finance your movie? I'm glad you brought that up. I figured out a way where you can finance my first movie. I could, what? That one did really well. We, you know, we got to do, you know, and that was a, that was an easy shoot in terms of, it was a one day shoot. It was a simple script. It's funny actually how that one came about was that uh, for, for the first time ever I was going to audition actors and I felt like um, I went to the internet and I found all these scripts that I downloaded. It's like, you know, I should have a script of my own other than the script that they were going to do. Sure. Um, and somehow I couldn't get, uh, one night I couldn't get a hundred rabid monkeys out of my head. And so I wrote Pitching Mother until I got to 100 Rabid Monkeys. And then I had them, I'm like, and I read it. I'm like, this um, sucks. But I didn't have anything else. So I'm like, uh, God, I don't want the actors to read this at all. But, you know, I, I don't want to look like a, a schmo either. So um, we gave it to the actors, and they just knocked it out of the park. I'm like, and they're like, why, why aren't we shooting this? Why are we shooting this stupid little movie about a guy in a zit? Have some faith in me once in your life. Well, I do. But this is well, then sign the papers. Don't you think that we should think about this just a little bit What's more? What's there to think about? You can't stand in the way of great art. It'll run right over you. Besides, you said I was talented. But, but, but I, I... Mother, I, if you believe in me, you'd sign the papers. Oh, God. Mother, if you loved me, you'd sign the papers. Sign the papers. Oh. It's go time, Mom. Sign the papers. Sign the damn papers. Put together, you know, turned out great. Had some great performances, and that we got to do film festivals with. That we did uh, Bermuda International Film Festival, um, Toronto, which is one of the biggest film festivals in the country. Um, we were MC, you know, our MC on that particular little short showcase was um, Kevin Spacey. You know, got, wow. to, got to party with him and all that stuff, and it was it was awesome. It was this fun thing, and I got to meet an agent, Willie Morris, and they, she gave me her card and said like, you can write and everything. And then I came home and uh, had nothing. It's gold with stones again. So, you know, there's there's something to be said about the whole f film festival route. There are so much fun, but um, do they open up doors? Well, questionable, in my opinion. You moved into um, the film and video production professionally at that point, or yes, um, we we did a couple projects um, before I did uh, Fear of Girls, and one was a television pilot called Cubes. Uh, it was kind of like an office before the office became known here. Um, uh, but the difference between Cubes and the office is the office was funny. So I, I, I understand that that com you know, I, I was trying to go for humor and uh, I didn't quite get there. So um, and we did a couple other projects but um, and then uh, I started working actually making a living uh, at, uh, at a production company here in the Twin Cities. So um, and uh, while there I we, um, we did Fear of Girls, so and that, that, that really turned out to be my biz, biggest success yet. Your ex digs deep into the skull of the cobalt <clears throat> shaman. Foul beast! Do you rue attacking crunk? Do you rue it? The last of the cobalt tribe has no time to scream <clears throat> as the force of your blow reduces it to a pink mist. <laughs> mercy? You wanted mercy? <laughs> I'm chaotic neutral! <laughs> God! Uh, the once proud cobalt tribe now ah! lies in diminutive severed limbs at your feet. Carnage drips victoriously from the ripples of your tan and enormously muscular chest. First Fear of Girls came to be is that uh, I started working at this production company and um, I felt like I really needed to do something. You know, with no, there's no business model. There's no established piece that say, I'm going to do a short film so I can become famous. That's kind of science fiction. You know, you do, I'm going to do a short film because I'm a masochist. But I love doing these things. I love making people laugh. I love comedy. And I had this um, screenplay I worked up called Fear of Girls. And I had a little bit of money, little, and I emphasize little, a bit of money. Um, and it was just going through the process of trying to get people to work. For, and there's, there are stories upon stories upon casting and, and what have you. And I don't want to bore you with the regalia with all the, 
the stories, but um, as much as there was a, a talent component in there, there was a huge luck component in there as well. Um, just with the people that came a part of it, um, you know, and, and there was some eye-opening stuff that, that came out of it. But it was, uh, you know, a lot of this, especially comedy, is so organic and finding the right cast and finding that right crew um, and it all coming together, the stars really aligned on this project. So Ryan helped out on a show that I did called Paper Hearts and based on that saw me work and had this script about these two guys who play Dungeons and Dragons way too much. And uh, so based on that, he called me in for an audition to audition for the thing. And uh, I, uh, I myself have played Dungeons and Dragons probably way too much. And so I had, you know, the wardrobe. I had these, you know, really thick, dorky glasses. I had, I had a retainer that I put in, you know, it was like this. I looked at this guy. I'm like, this guy is like the uber geek. He, uh, you know, he has fought his way to the top of the nerd pile. And, uh, and I have a pretty good finger on the pulse of who he is and the weird kind of self-involved world that he lives in. Tom knows his stuff. Not only has, is he a brilliant actor and an incredible comedian and a massively talented improv artist, but he knows this world. He knows the role-playing world. He knows the nuance of that world, and he brought, brought it to, 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 to bear. Scott Jorgensen was amazing. Actually, there was kind of like a hunt and peck type of period because um, we had two different people lined up to play the Ray character, and it was very kind of like back and forth in terms of where that guy lived and what their relationship was like. And, um, you know, Ryan was really, you know, insistent on finding the right person. And we had one person who had a scheduling conflict and one person who just wasn't sure about the project. So like, well, I don't know. It's just some random short thing. I, I think I'll pass. So uh, fortunately, I had worked with Scott Jorgensen before. And uh, I said, you know, he, he's so talented and he's, you know, he's an improv guy. He's so sharp. Like, you gotta, you gotta look at this guy. I think we had a week to shooting, and he's like, "Okay, well, like, I guess we'll go with Scott." You know, um, it was, it was fortunate, but it was a lot of fun, and I never had any question that you know Scott was gonna work out great in that role. I think Charles Hubble may have, uh, may have mentioned him or Tom. I'm not sure Tom Wall, one of the two, and just said, uh, "Look, uh, we." You know how these are weekend shoots. We got two days to try to shoot this thing or whatever. And uh, hey, are, are you available? It's it's pretty funny stuff, and it sounds like you'd be perfect for the role. And I'm like, you know, actually, I am. It it was the only two days out of that whole month uh, for various reasons, not acting. Uh, I was available, and so we. Uh, I literally uh, got the script like a week before. Barely had time to get through it and look at it, and uh, that is literally. Are you available? Yes. What is it? I'll tell you about it. These role-playing guys, and yeah, it sounds great. Give it, yeah, sure. And uh, hell yeah, let's go for it. Uh, I've been blessed with um, these amazing, amazing actors that I like to let them. I like to create archetypes of characters. That means there's there's nuance within the characters as well. I like them to have a very well-defined, sketched-out idea of where this character's at, um, and then let them go with it. Let them have fun with it. And sometimes out of that, you really get this great direction that they take it. And that's something you didn't even think of, like, oh my God, I didn't even think of that. You know, and, and that's kind of an influence where the characters go. But you know, with Ryan, the, the great thing about the process is he has the script and he has the story and he knows where he wants it to go and what the relationships are going to be like. And we will shoot all of that, but then he'll let you run with it on the back end, you know? Okay, bring whatever you got. Let's do a take that's really big and take it whatever direction you want. Or scene's over, we're gonna keep rolling the cameras and just see what comes out next. And to have that kind of freedom is really liberating and it allows you to discover things about the character that you may not otherwise have thought of. Um, you still need to get them to point, you know, point B. You know, if right. you start them at A, you still need to get them to B or the film's not gonna work. But the way, what they bring to that, the, the talent of the actors, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, this film is a collaboration of everybody. And did it start out exactly the way, way you thought of it? No, it started, it, it turned out better. Because, you know, everybody's giving honest input and in how to make this film better, not how, hey, by the way, I'm smarter than you, so here's how the, we should do it. That's not how we operate in the set. There's a, this good, 
mojo that goes on and when people are laughing and have a great time, that's when you know you're going to have a great film. Uh, working with Tom, it's, 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 it's not work. It, it, we just crack up. We, we could sit and play on the damn couch all day just laughing and making each other laugh. And, you know, thank God someone's there. Ryan's got to tell us to get back on script or book. But you just, you, we could just do this all afternoon, cracking each other up, making each other laugh. Uh, so, yeah. I have got three rules of filmmaking. Uh, and the first is you got to love your story. You have to love your stories. I mean, that's this the only reason why you get into this, you know, first and foremost. Um, uh, if you don't like, love your stories, then you're kind of getting into this the wrong way because this isn't about fame and it's not certainly not about fortune. And uh, you know, and so I think some people get into the wrong way. I mean, some people is like, well, um, I'm a douchebag, uh, so how best can I go out and look like the biggest douchebag in the world? Um, well, filmmaking, <laughs> perfect. Um, the second is that you got to learn your craft because you get a lot of creative people and they have a lot of big ideas, but there is a craft to it. And, and really it is, if you can't people, pay people money, you have to respect their time and their talent. I think those are just as important resources. And a part of that is that, um, you know, uh, learn your craft. And the third rule, again, you know, kind of touched on it, don't be a douchebag, you know? So yeah, it, it's, this is a, people are helping you out, kind of realizing your dream, you know? And this, it, by no means is this a Ryan Wood project or has it ever been a Ryan Wood project. It's a collaboration of incredible people. Um, it starts with the script, but ends with a, gr a group. So it might start with one person, but it ends with a group as the end product, and that's the, the, the case in the matter. Um, that's, that's on the first one. Um, uh, Andy Hunt worked on it, who was on the lot. Uh, he, he, he contributed a great deal. Clint Carlson, who was the editor, um, you know, worked magic on it. So yeah, we, we're all in the trenches together. And I'm probably forgetting, oh, Vanessa Miles, who was the art director, was, yeah, it's worked on like six projects of mine now. And, you know, if I, if I don't ever work with another art director again, I'm okay with, I got Vanessa. You know, I can joke with Ryan, we can, you know, it's easier to come up with more funny things and try more creative things. On a corporate thing, you have to be very professional. You have to come with your drawings and your boards and your color swatches and be very, you know, specific, and with Ryan, it's like, you know, if I, if I thought of something the day before we're shooting, and I'm like, this would really be funny, you know, he'd listen, and we might try it, or, you know, take it into consideration, or even while we're shooting, you know, and so he's more laid back, and, you know, open to creative input. And uh, it was just lots of shoot, and go, and roll, and, and, and letting people ad-lib, and have some fun, and go with stuff, and, uh, he would just kind of got no stay on this go go and then he'd turn us loose and uh, it was just a blast it was just kind of done just like that two days. Oh, I got lucky I, and, and I'll, I'll say this right now. Um, I knew I was going to put on the internet. I knew I was going to go film festivals, but there was no strategy involved at the time. There was I'm going to tell you know all my friends, all eight of them, you know where the film was, and I posted on one little website and um, just I expected it to be a resume piece like hey. By the way, go see this and, you know, laugh and have a good time. But I didn't think it was going to blow up like it did. I had um, a friend in another state tell me about this YouTube video that was going around his office. And um, he watched the credits and he said, well, your name was in it and you make movies. And I thought maybe it was you, so I had to call you. And it was Fear of Girls going around his office in a completely different state. And I thought, you know, how great is that? I really didn't have any expectations, you know? I mean, this was, uh, this was the end of 2005 that we were shooting this thing, and like, internet video really did not exist in any significant way, shape, or form. I mean, YouTube was so brand new, we didn't even know what it was, we weren't gonna upload there. I mean, Google had a video thing going on, um, and people really weren't, watching that much online video so it was all kind of brand new territory and I was just you know grateful to be involved in uh, you know in a project that had you know talented people attached to it you know I didn't even think about putting your movie online like I just didn't think that was an option I thought festivals and you know um, you know putting all you know shorts together from one town or with one topic and 
doing it that way, I didn't think we would. I just didn't think about YouTube, and I wasn't a, a regular YouTube watcher. So. And it's funny, so I, I posted on Google Video, um, and I told the eight people, and I posted on one website called Dig at the time, which is still kind of a growing, was at the time a growing website. And I got like 50 digs before it was buried, and, and then, but it's funny, the first day I got like 30 views, and I think 10 of them were me making sure it was running. You know, and the day after that I got like 50 views. I'm like, excellent, people are watching them. The day after that I got 180 views. I'm like, sweet. So you can check your day views on a day-to-day -day basis. And the day after that I got 1,800 views. I'm like, wow, what happened there? Look at that spike. And the day after that I got 25,000 views. And the day after that I got 58,000 views. And the day, you know, in two weeks we peaked at 280,000 views. And what happened is just people were just grabbing that link and passing it around and all this stuff. And then I started getting weird phone calls from like MTV and agents and all this other crazy stuff. And it just cascaded into something pretty big, so. Um, you know, it was interesting because I was down in Nashville shooting a, a different project and I got off the plane and one of my buddies called me and he's like, dude, Fear of Girls is blowing up. And I'm like, this, I mean, it was a weird, like it was almost like, I, I hate to even use this term, but it was almost a little like a, like a Hollywood moment. Like I step off the plane and I get this voicemail from my friend, you know, that, and I didn't know what to expect. And then like two days later it got slash dotted. And that's when I was like, oh, okay, this thing really does have legs, you know? Um, so it was bizarre, yeah. <laughs> it, I was excited. I was glad that, that people, um, you know, were interested in it. And, and, and appreciated it for what it was and, and got laughs out of it. You know, that what, what's kind of di a little different with Fear of Girls compared to a lot of the stuff you find is that it's 12 minutes. So it's a longer piece. Um, uh, it's a narrative piece. There's a beginning, middle, and end to it um, where a lot of it are just kind of clips. Uh, some of them, you know, they're one tricks. You know, they're, they're, um, a lot of it's just topical too. You know, it's it's the Britney Spears, you know, coming out and crying about Britney Spears and then you disappear. You know, there, there's not, it's it's a lot of gloss, but I don't think there's a lot of content behind it. I think what was nice about Fear of Girls is very content rich um, and geek is chic too. And if you actually see the whole um, peaks of that, um, you, you see the websites that it was actually posted to, Kotaku, Slashdot, all these different blogs, whatever. And, and it is, it's a gamer centric film. We have tried to game with uh, hobbyist gamers, and frankly, uh, we have transcended their level of sophistication. Uh, we made a mistake once of allowing some neighborhood kids to play. Once. Yeah, they stole my dice. And those people are human trash. Immediate, 10 dice, 6 lightning bolt, no saving throw. Game Master Doug is hard, but fair. I, I flew up to LA, and um, you know, I we got all kinds of meetings. Uh, I was in them for three days, um, and I had a meeting with um, uh, Comedy Central. I had a meeting with Disney Channel. Um, it was actually ABC, ABC Family who, who approached us. They weren't even aware that we were, I was down in LA meeting like across the street from them when they emailed me. Um, or it was actually across the building, the same building, across the hallway. Um, Comedy Central, um, uh, Universal, um, Fox we met with. Uh, I miss my Warner Brothers meeting. Uh, you know, there's, I mean, we got to meet the, the, like, the major studios and because we had an internet success. And, and what did they want from you? They wanted to know kind of how we did it and how it happened, you know, and I think, you know, there, there's a lot of touchy-feely going on right now, or especially at the time. I think there's more action going on right now, but there's a lot of touchy-feely, like, like, how does this stuff happen? And we kind of want to understand this and how, how can we kind of how can we bend this to our business model? And a lot of it wasn't really making sense. I'm like, well, you know, do people log in? Do they see ads? Are they holding a Mountain Dew on their head? You know, you know, what's what's going on? I don't understand. And I'm like, well, people are watching it. Um, it's like you're not making any money. It's like I'm not making any money. It's like, oh, what does she look like? Mm. Her gold blonde blonde hair spills oh. past her alabaster shoulders like springs of honey mead. Her full, ample breasts are barely covered by a sheen of magical elven chainmail. <laughs> Leather leggings hug her butter supple loins. I want to have sex with her. Okay. Uh, give me a roll. So, yeah, you know, make a long story short, we did, uh, Disney was going to launch what's called the Comedy Incubator website. We're the first property 
um, for, for them to option. Their, their whole thing is like, we want you to tell your stories. Like, awesome, I'm in. So it was a really good plan, you know, and give, give us some, some great cash to, to, to make something with. And uh, it didn't really turn out. It didn't, uh, the relationship really didn't turn out. Um, you know, we, we did a lot of sitting and waiting, um, waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And really waiting it- Waiting for? Um, for them to launch their Comedy Incubator website, which never happened. Um, you know, I have such an incredible agent. He made sure that uh, we still owned our rights. They just had an exclusivity on it to a, a certain point and a non-exclusivity off of that. So we still owned the rights to Fear of Girls. So basically, a month before our, our exclusivity expired, they just posted it up on abcfamily.com. So you go to abcfamily.com and watch Fear of Girls. So it, it didn't it didn't really work out for us. But you know, it's it was a great educational experience, and you know, we move on. Then Disney optioned the, the rights and asked us to make Fear of Girls too. And um, I felt like there was more pressure, but they still, you know, they kept their distance. You know, they were gonna let Ryan do his thing, but it seemed more, there were definitely more fingers from above in the project. <laughs> we're all such a good team at, you know, being creative and doing spur of the moment bunnies that I think too much structure limits your creativity you know to like too much planning you know you don't get the same you don't get the same thing you know it's it comes out the way you said it was and the way you planned it to be but it's not as spontaneous and doesn't have the same energy I think two was really funny but I think I think it just had a different tone. Yeah, it's been kind of weird ever since episode one came out. I mean, we got all kinds of fans now. One of the things that gets me uh, uh, cracking up about it is you, you follow their lives and this web, uh, web-based notoriety that they had, because the first Fear of Girls broke like three million hits or something, and so people knew about these two guys. Well, uh, Ryan Wood, uh, uh, captured that, that there was some internet success on this and started writing about them realizing their own internet success. And uh, so Doug and Ray now kind of know or think in their heads they're, they're a little famous. And uh, so it kind of feeds on itself that there's it's a reality show of these two guys that game and want to play games. They're not games, these are role playing Dungeons and Dragons members, not games. And uh, welcome into their lives. The second one um, and, and the subsequent episodes, uh, we never intended it to be a series. It wasn't until we got approached by Disney um, that like, wow, there's something to it and it turned out really well and it's not a closed series. We can really do something with it. And the scene that really kind of clicked it all together for me is, is the scene where the, the two almost kiss. And then they look right into the camera and they're aware that this audience is on them. And the whole idea of, of what's going on in the internet right now, um, I think, is ripe for satire. Is great for satire. It's almost the the, the the theme behind our fear of girls that the direction we're taking now is the accessible celebrity. So it's like you can have a video camera, you can have that internet feed, and all of a sudden, um, you're you're famous. Celebrity is the bearer of unwanted gifts. Uh, unwittingly, you are catapulted into a realm where some will seek you out for your wisdom, but others, the ones that earn the fiery brunt of my fury, somehow believe that they have an understanding of my depth, as if they've quaffed some potion of wisdom that gives them license to judge. I loathe these troglodytes. Um, well, you know, the, uh, uh, playing Doug Doug is sort of a, a double-edged sword because uh, he has a certain amount of internet cachet, right, among the geek elite, if you want to. I mean, I have friends who to this day are like, dude, we quote Fear of Girls every time we play D&D. &D. I guarantee every session somebody says, give me a roll. Um, 
And so that's fun. I, like, I enjoy that aspect of it. But uh, the flip side to that is uh, because he's got the crazy hair and the thick eyebrows and the retainer and the glasses, I honestly don't get recognized that much as Doug Doug, which I can't complain about too much. He's not an attractive guy. I, you know, um, I have I have gamed with people like Doug Doug. Um, it can be challenging. <laughs> a little more high stakes for number two, because um, you know, hey, we're going to throw some coin at you and try to do number two, and we're going to give you a little more of a budget. We're going to try to get a set. We're going to try to get all this stuff, and uh, it was a blast, absolute. And number three, uh, man, just a, a well-oiled machine. Uh, I mean, I, once again, I, it, uh, Jason and Ryan, it just, it just flowed. I mean, it just, it, everything flowed so nicely. <clears throat> Doug, Doug, I have, I have a question. Um, now, the last episode of whatever this is that you're doing, no, that didn't do quite as well as the first yes, episode. Yes, 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 so, and uh, I can address that. Okay. Um, the, uh, the last episode that we did um, featured females, and um, we just feel that the internet audience in general uh, does not have any interest in uh, videos featuring females. I kind of felt like a failure after the second one because the second one didn't take off as much and we, we made some missteps. Um, we did play with the formula a little bit, you know, kind of trying to establish where we were going with it. Um, but man, you know, the, the finally I just came up, it's like, you know what, I think there's a bigger story here. And I think there's a fun story here. And, uh, you know, after I got done feeling sorry for myself, I decided, you know, it's, it's you know, buck up, you know, and, uh, you know, I had a little bit of money on me. So I, but not enough to pay people this time. So we had to go from paying people to not paying people. A tough transition. Which is a tough transition, because he's like, hey, uh, you remember me? Uh, I'm kind of a failure. And remember the last one I got to pay you for? Uh, I failed, and you don't get paid for this one. Come work for me. Come on, come on. It's just going to great. Uh, and they did. So, you know, it just shows the tenacity of this community um, here in Minneapolis, this film community, which I think is is massively talented. Um, it shows the incredible talent of the producer um, that I've worked with on the second and third one now, and hopefully more, um, who is pound for pound one of the best producers I've ever worked with, uh, Jason Wallace. I think he's, he's gifted, and if anybody, you know, who, who owns the kudos to actually bring these at budget and get these things done, it's gonna be Jason, so. I mean, I knew that Ryan, he has works for many. Like, he's got the story um, through quite a few episodes, and we had talked about that. So I knew there was more to Doug and Raymond, but I wasn't sure when or if, if the thing with Disney, you know, how it affected Ryan and how he felt about the story. Um, he called me, I was living in Chicago, and he called me and he said, he wants to make the third one, and I said, I'm all for it, you know, my favorite project, so. I so mean. does it affect you when, uh, when Ryan has to call you and say, well, I can't pay you on this one? You know, a little bit. When we made the first one, I was still coming out of the, you know, stage where I'll work for free and, you know, meet lots of people and get, and now I'm more settled and I need income but with Ryan it's different you know I know this crew I know the actors and it's like family so it's, I do it either way but it's such a fun project like it's it's like having fun it's not like working <laughs> we had a huge meeting without Ryan to see where how we could really take this thing and make it work. And I'm just kidding. Just, it, it, um, you'll love that. Uh, no, uh, you know, it, it just feels like a, a, a bunch of buddies. Man, I, I feel like I'm on like E! Entertainment right now when everybody says this cheesy ass answer, but we're like a big family. and. No, but everybody is, man. You, you, you get good people in place, and they just let us do our thing. And Ryan tells these great stories. Uh, 
Jason gets together and collaborates all these people and between the two of them, everybody. I mean, you know, it, it's, a, it's a great group of people and you really, when you walk in the room, when you smile, I now see how groups and casts get really close. You know, I like the characters and I love the opportunity to work in this style. Um, you know, Ryan really gives me an opportunity to uh, bring things to the table that I don't get in most scripted work. Um, a lot of, um, you know, film and TV stuff, you say your lines to the word or you're fired, you know? I mean, they're, they do not want you paraphrasing. That will lose you an audition um, for sure. So, so in this type of environment, you don't get that. You don't get that opportunity to be creative. I, I think it's the integrity, not only myself, but Jason Wallace brings to the, to the, the set. They know that we're not going to waste anybody's time nor talent. Um, you know, uh, I, I believe if I'm the filmmaker, then I need to be the hardest person, working person on that. that. That means you get your storyboards done. That means you have your shots clearly, you know, defined. That means everything, so people aren't waiting around for, you know, me to be, you know, it's like, shh, everybody be quiet, I need to think. I mean, that's, that's bull****. I, I think you need to have everything kind of planned on your head. Um, if you're going to be the captain of the ship and everybody's looking you at, for you for leadership and guidance to, to move this, you know, you know basically dock this, this boat, um, you need to have it all kind of figured out beforehand. The sins that you commit in pre-production, you're always going to pay for in post. Yeah, we made our own role-playing game. <laughs> uh, I hesitate to even refer to it as a game. I do. Uh, game is a term that suggests uh, toys or uh, trivial baubles. And this is a fantasy universe reborn hard. Yeah, it's gonna blow the dice right out of your pants. Poo! I think Ryan, he thinks about his actors and he thinks about his crew and he really knows people and he can see what they're good at and he, he knows how to get the best out of people's performances, you know, crew and cast wise. And I've never, you know, I've never been able to work with somebody who's that good at working with people. It was an awesome crew. It was a great crew. I had the, this incredible sound guy, his name is Terry Pounds. I've heard of him, he's not bad. He's a, oh, he's a little uh, deaf, so I don't know why he's working. He's deaf in one ear, uh, so the sound might be a little kajankity, but no. Uh, uh, no, we had like three directors of photography, um, Sam Fisher, Steve Holm, Bo Hakla, all worked on it, incredible talent, Vanessa was there, incredible cast, um, we had uh, the original cast from the first one come back, um, uh, you know, uh, Tom Lommel, Scott Jorgensen, Charles Hubble, Emily Hansen, um, the mother from Pitching Mother, Nancy Marvick, dear to my heart, she came into it, uh, and this, Matt, uh, this uh, Bill Bore, who you'll find out. Awesome, just awesome. So uh, even the extras were incredible. So I, I couldn't ask for a tighter cast and crew uh, on this Grant Wood, who's not my brother. I actually have a brother named Grant Wood, but Grant Wood on the third one, not my brother. Great AD, massively talented AD. So, um, so Grant Wood, not my brother. Great AD. Uh, yeah, the, the, I was I was blown away by the quality of the crew, by the quality of the cast, and and we weren't. Necessarily, we didn't have, we had less than a tenth of the budget on this one. Um, we had more equipment, more cast, more crew. And really, again, it shows the tenacity of this, this community and shows the, the, the need to really do great stories, fun stories, you know, and people loved the first two. So, you know, it was, it was just this incredible experience. Many may be surprised to find that Krunk's greatest challenge was not the multitude of dragons that he faced or the uh, plague of psionic liches, but uh, contracting Nurgle's black pecker rot. I mean, I knew better. You know how it is. I mean, you're in there with some buxom bar wench and things are getting all hot and heavy and you just decide, I gotta risk the roll. You risk the roll. Um, you know, I mean, I think one of the, the good uh, turns for episode three is that rather than releasing it as one chunk and just pushing it out there, um, there's gonna be a series of episodes that will come out so that you can keep being reminded and stay engaged with what's going on in the story. I think one of the, you know, the issues, <clears throat> I think one of the struggles that we had with 
the transition to episode two was that was, there was literally a two year gap between the two of them coming out, and a lot of people saw it as kind of a you know a one shot thing and then forgot about it, didn't know that there was going to be anything else. Um, and that's you know that's the struggle of not having a, a marketing aspect to internet video. I mean, when it goes viral, the only way to keep it in people's minds is to keep producing more content. And this time around, we're going to have a stream of things that we're going to pump out. You know, and we'll have plenty of outtakes and extras and things like that that we'll be able to use as little filler pieces to just keep pushing it out there and get it back up into people's minds and recapture those eyeballs. I've got a I've got a 13 episode arc sketched out. Oh. So I've got a 13 episode arc all sketched out and direction we're going with that. Now, how strongly we stay with that arc really depends. There's some things that came out of three that I didn't think were going to come out of three, and there might be a smarter direction to go. But at the end, they still kind of go to the same place. So, you know, the path is, you know, the, the, the destination is the same. The path might be a little different, though. Uh, and three, by the time we got into the third one, now we're like, we are, we, we can pull into those guys in a second. And, uh, oh, man, it'll be fun to see wherever we take them. Take a look around here and stuff. You can see that she's got all sorts of special balls and crap around here. So it's kind of interesting. Looks like a wood gnome. I think, I think you'll see more of Doug and Raymond. Um, and I think it's only gonna get better. www.youtube.com forward slash fear of girls right now. It's all one word, fear of girls. So, um, and until we get um, a different website. So that might be right down here. This is the website you wanna go to. <laughs> Whatever this is going to be, go to this one. I don't know what this is going to be. I'm just pointing at my schwans right now. So, This is the uh, first game specifically created for the role-playing professional. A totally untapped market. Uh, in fact, I have considered including a large disclaimer on the cover that says, uh, if you only game on the weekends or uh, a couple times <laughs> a week, um, move on. For this game, we'll break you. Yeah, this is like full-on hardcore fantasy for full-on hardcore. I hope anyone watching this, if you haven't yet, go out and find the Fear of Girls series. Search in Google. It's all over the place. Um, check them out. They're really incredibly funny, totally worth your time. And I want to thank you for taking the time to check out my show. Now, music for today's episode was provided by... Kelly McMorrow with her CD, All of This is Temporary. And of course, our regular contributor, Casey Nelson. We will be featuring new bands every month. So bands, go to lbsproductions.com and let us know about your music. And here's a look at next month's episode. Well, I was with the group of uh, Sudanese miners, now known as the Lost Boys of Sudan. We like to say that we uh, put a face on the numbers. Be talking about my experience as a Bugandan survivor. Baby steps in the face of a genocide are utterly inadequate. So I ran from there, never went back home. The simple truth is that it's regular people that have nothing to do with the complexities who are the victims. And the only reason I'm still alive is that he lied when, when people got him. I did nothing to save her family. And that's the kind of culpability that all of us, if we are bystanders, truly should admit to. It's our fault, it's our responsibility. I do hope you'll join us next month for that episode. Uh, the subject means a great deal to me personally, so please tell your friends. Uh, speaking of which, you can become a fan of the show now on Facebook, so please join us there. Uh, also look for exclusive content at lbsproductions.com. And again, my name is Terry Pounds. I'm sorry about my cold this month. But thank you for watching, and this has been A Microscopic Life. Mm -hmm.